Let's pray together. Our Father, we are so thankful for your word today. We pray that it would uh, breathe life into hearts that perhaps this morning come in with uh, anxiety, worry, um, concerns of different types. Perhaps we're tired and weary uh, from a difficult week. We pray that wherever we might find ourselves in joy or in pain, that your word would come and meet us, uh, that it would be uh, what we need for this moment. We trust that you are in control of all things, including this hour together. So would you do a work in our hearts that will transform us Draw us closer to Jesus, love you more, and love the world around us more. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Liars, adulterers, and racists. The shame of the proud, the shame of the guilty, the greedy, the angry, the envious, the ungrateful, the violent, the selfish, and the too far gone. The story of the Bible is not that there is no place for these kinds of people. The story of the Bible is actually that that's the very reason that Jesus has come into the world for these kinds of people. That there is grace for the absolute worst of us, that there is grace for me and for you. That is the story of the Bible, filled with all kinds of people, broken, hurting stories of sin and shame, and yet, that is exactly what the gospel of Jesus Christ is meant for. This week, we are continuing in a series as we look and peer into conversations that Jesus had with people while he was on the earth. And it's been a stunning reality of what it looks like when God himself comes into human history, engages with people where they are, doesn't ignore them, doesn't, is not scared of them, but he, he looks at them eye to eye. And this morning, we get to see something wonderful as he visits a woman by the well. This story, I think, um, is, is an honest story. It's raw. There's a lot of tension and some awkward moments in it, but I think it's real for what we actually face in life. It, it's relevant to who we are, the kinds of lives and past and stories that make us who we are. And, and so this morning, as we go into this unpolished story, it's messy, it's tense, but we get to see the heart of Jesus for people like you and me. And so let's jump right into the Gospel of John, chapter 4, the passage that Nate, Nate read for us this morning, reading from verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus... Wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So to give you a picture of what's happening, Jesus is in Judea. He needs to make his way to Galilee. And John tells us in verse 4 of this chapter that he had to pass through Samaria to get there. That to get from Judea to Galilee, he has to pass through Samaria. He had to. It almost feels like there's no other option that Jesus has before him. But he did not actually have to go through Samaria to get to Galilee. In fact, the most common route wasn't even go, to go through Samaria to get to Galilee. And we'll say why on that in a moment. But I don't think the had to here that we see in verse 2, the I had to go to Samaria, is a matter of geological constraint or about expediency or urgency to get to his next destination. It wasn't about fleeing the Pharisees in fear because they were starting to get critical and soon they would come after him himself. And I think that this was, for Jesus, a purposeful pass-through stop-in in Samaria. The had-to sounds more like it's a, a compelling, like, I, I have to go through Samaria. I have to get to Galilee, but I have an appointment in Samaria. I have a mission. I have something I have to take care of in Samaria. Listen, we may not know all the reasons that Jesus had for going to Samaria. We, we can't possibly know. But this was no accidental or incidental decision. Jesus has purpose behind this, intention behind it. And friends, I just want to say one side note as we think about this. It's a small section of this 42-verse ch uh, chapter. Uh, but would you know that in this small section, we realize that God is never just doing one thing in your life or in the world. He's never just up to one thing that you can see. Uh, you'd be lucky to know one or two things that God may be up to in the details of your life and in this world. 
when God does something, would you know that he's actually doing thousands of things behind the scenes? He has thousands of reasons and intentions and purposes for every small and big thing that happens in your life and in the world. Nothing for God is wasted. There is no wasted experience or circumstance. Everything that happens in your life and in the world is purposeful. And the scriptures remind us that they are working together for the good of those who love him. And so here, what may seem incidental or accidental or happenstance, not at all. Jesus has purpose behind this. And so verse 6 also tells us that Jesus is weary from his journey once he finally gets to Samaria. And so he sits at what's known as, the, as Jacob's well. He's weary, he's thirsty, he's hungry. Can you imagine Jesus after journeying from, from Judea to, to Samaria, the Son of God? Remember, Jesus is the Son of God, weary God who is weary and, and thirsty and hungry. He tells his disciples, please, can you go grab me some food? I could use a sandwich. This is God who is hungry and thirsty and tired. But, but what a thought that the humanity of Jesus, as we've been talking about, would actually get weary and, and thirsty. Charles Spurgeon, who we've quoted a lot recently, has this great, great few words about this. He says this. Charles Spurgeon, a late great preacher, says, but only think, if you and I were hungry and we could turn stones into bread, would we not do it? If we were weary and could immediately give ourselves the rest that we required, would we not do so? Why, I think the water would have been glad to leap out of the well to refresh the lips of him who had created it. That well had been honored by suddenly pouring forth all its liquid refreshment that he might drink and be satisfied. But Jesus never wrought a miracle merely for his own comfort. He felt that his miraculous power was to be used for others and in his great work, but as for himself, his humanity must bear its own infirmity. It must support its own trials, so he keeps his hand back from relieving his own necessities. Would you consider Jesus, the Son of God, no place to lay his head? When he's, when he's hungry, he doesn't just conjure up some bread. When he's thirsty, he doesn't just spring forth water from the ground. When he's tired, he doesn't create a mattress on the ground to lay his head on. No, no. Jesus, when he comes into the world, restrains himself. He's often tired. He's often weary. He's often challenged by others. But he restrains himself. He has all the force of all the power of the divinity. And yet, he restrains himself because, you know what? He wants to feel and experience this life in the hard and grueling ways that you and I do. He feels tired and thirsty. He feels hurt. He weeps. He sympathizes with the weaknesses and liabilities of man. He endures the trials that we face. He walks the roads that you and I walk. And so as Jesus sits at Jacob's well, we, we get to then see him engaging with this woman at the well. And in fact, this is the longest conversation that Jesus has ever had with someone in the scriptures. This is the longest recorded conversation that he's had. So reading from verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So Jesus, he's weary, he's hungry, he's thirsty. I mean, if he was in Philly, he would have told his disciples to go get him a Wawa sandwich. And he's waiting now, sitting at this well, waiting for some food and some, maybe a slushy or something. He wants to get rehydrated. But I think this is actually purposeful. I think you don't need 12 people to go and get sandwiches, right? This, this entire group of disciples now goes off to get some food and drink. And Jesus now sits beside this well. And when the woman comes to draw water from the well, Jesus te tells her, give me a drink. This conversation that's going to soon become a very profound conversation starts in the most natural way. He just says, give me a drink. He sits beside the well, says, give me a drink. I heard one preacher say this. Some of us may think that when we talk about God to other people, that we, we want to communicate the truth of who God is, his gospel, his love, his grace. Some of us might think that we need to start in some kind of way. We, we get a voice that's deep and we say, hello there, I would like to have a theological conversation with you. And it never goes that way, right? People would run out the door if you started a conversation that way. But would you consider Jesus is talking about water here? 
and the conversation begins to boom and, and go out into all kinds of branches that, that give truth and meaning to this conversation in a way. It's natural. He's warm to this woman. He's, he's gentle and caring. And so he co- engages in this conversation simply about water beside a well. And as he does, her reaction actually immediately is one of surprise and shock. Because here's what verse 9 says. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, would ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And then it says in brackets, Therefore Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. When you first read that, give me a drink. What's so odd about that? Why, why, Why is that such a tense moment? Well, I think for any of us, that wouldn't seem unusual, but in that culture and time, Jews and the Samaritans were bitter enemies. They did not like each other because at one point, the Jews, when they were conquered, they were exiled to Babylon, and they, the, the ones who were left over began to intermingle and, and marry the, those who were in, uh, who are the Canaanites. And eventually, their religions became syncretized, and it was sort of this mix of religion, mix of culture. And then when the Jews saw this, They saw them as theological heretics, as unclean people. They saw them as inferior racially to them. They they did not like the Samaritans. They were brutal enemies. They didn't like them. And so here, you see Jesus engaging with this Samaritan woman. In fact, it may be for this reason that the most common route from Judea to Galilee is not through Samaria. You'd rather take an extra few hours around Samaria because you don't want to be sullied and and marked by these unclean people. You don't want to even engage with them. So here is this Jewish man now sitting at a well, engaging with a Samaritan woman. Not only that, but it would also be scandalous for a Jewish man to engage in a conversation with a strange woman just period, much less a Samaritan woman. But not only that... The text tells us a very key detail here. It's the sixth hour, which is noon. And it also tells us that she goes to the well by herself on her her own. Why is this significant? Well, scholars tell us that during that culture, during that time, women would go early in the morning to the well to get water for the day, for the routines of the day. They would go early in the morning because it's cooler in the day. They can carry water and it would be an easier journey. But not only that, they went together as a group. They would socialize and they would speak and talk with one another on the journey. And so this woman at the well in this scene is not only there in the morning, is not only there uh, not with other people, but she's there at noon and she's on her own. But why? Well, it's because she's actually a moral outcast. She's a moral outcast within a society who's already moral outcasts. She's actually an outsider among outsiders. She is the most marginalized person in this kind of a culture and society. She was on the outside of the outside. She came alone and during a time when no one else would see her, so she would prevent herself from shame and ridicule from others. We'll speak more about what what that means. But when Jesus speaks to her, he is reaching. Would you hear this? Jesus in this moment, sitting beside the well, is reaching across several barriers to reach this woman. Barriers of culture and race and gender and morality, and society. A Jewish religious male shouldn't have nothing to do with this woman, but guess what? Jesus doesn't care. He does care, in fact. He doesn't care about those on the outside. He cares about this woman, and he's pursuing her at the well. So here, we see Jesus willing to cross any barrier to reach those who are lost and on the outside. And so Jesus asks for water, The woman wonders why he is engaged with her in a conversation at all. And Jesus continues in verse 10. It reads, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now Jesus here begins to unpack this this metaphor with water. Would you consider he first came to the well asking for water, and now here he is offering water to this woman by the, 
by the well. And not just any water. He says it's living water. What's living water? I mean, we've got smart water. We've got life water. But what is living water? What is that like? It, it can't be better than Fiji water, right? What's living water? What, what is the, what's the components of that? Living water here is a metaphor for eternal life for something that's lasting and, and long and persevering. It's, it's something deeper and more profound. Jesus is saying to this woman, within a culture, would you hear, if you were here for uh, Mike's call to worship and, and confession today, he spoke about what it's like to be in a desert and be hit with a waterfall or just a drop of water. This culture is beside a desert, and so water is not easy to come by. It's not the 21st century. You don't have water on a tap available to you right away. Water is... Is a, is a valuable commodity. And so when Jesus uses this, this metaphor, it means something to people. And so Jesus is saying to her, I have spiritual water for you that is even more necessary to you than physical water. Something that is more uh, consequential, more, more important to your life than even the water that you drink. And so the woman in almost comical fashion says in verses 11 and 12, Jesus, you can almost sense the sarcasm. It's like she's from Philly. Like, where do you get this living water, Jesus? You don't even have a bucket. How are you going to lower a bucket with, with nothing? How are you going to throw it down into the well? She's still thinking about physical water, right? And so she sort of, she, she, has, she doesn't have an understanding of what he's talking about. She even says, listen, do you even know Jacob? Do you know who Jacob is? Are you greater than Jacob? Jacob himself drank from this well. His sons, his livestock, they drank from this well. And I'm, I'm regularly astounded by the patience of Jesus. Can you imagine what it takes for a man like Jesus, the Son of God, to not respond to that? I, I mean, the irony of asking the man who created Jacob, do you know, are you greater than Jacob? I mean, I breathed life into him and his son and his cows, Right? <laughs> He created all of it, and yet for a, man to, uh, for a woman to ask, do you, do you know Jacob? Are you greater than Jacob? And he doesn't say anything. He doesn't flinch. He doesn't say, of course I'm greater than Jacob. I'm better than Jacob. He is, but he doesn't say it. It's because he has nothing to prove, but he's on a mission. He wants to know this woman. He wants to know what she longs for. He wants to know what makes her tick, what's in her heart. So instead, he desires to take another path, and he doesn't respond to that question. And so Jesus tells her, listen, everyone who drinks out of this water, this water from Jacob's well, will be thirsty again. You're going you're gonna to be quenched for a little while, but soon enough, you will get thirsty again. Verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in him like a spring of life, water, a water welling up to eternal life. This is not just water for salvation, though it is. This is something that's eternal and lasting. But I think Jesus is even trying to press deeper than just salvation here. Jesus is going deeper. This kind of water, this kind of living water that Jesus is speaking about is the deep soul satisfaction that a person has. It's the level of contentment and fulfillment and joy that surpasses circumstance and things that happen from outside of you. This kind of water is the kind of contentment that is within you, that does not depend on what is happening outside of you. So I ask you, Seven Mile Road, I ask you, friends, what makes you content? What makes you happy? What makes you fulfilled and satisfied? What is it that will give you a satisfying life? One pastor from New York, Tim Keller, said it like this. Almost always we will ask, answer the question of what makes us most happy by thinking of something outside of you. Romantic love, career, a political cause or a social cause, money, what money can do for us. Whatever it is that makes you say, if I have that, if I get there, 
Then I'll know that I'm important and that I matter and that I have significance. Then I'll know that I have purpose and meaning. Then I'll know that I have security. If those are your answers, it's likely something outside of you and not within you. And yet here is this woman. He is saying that there is nothing outside of you that can truly give you contentment and satisfaction. There is nothing. If all that you are looking for is outside of you, the reality of life is that there's nothing outside of you that will give you lasting, unfettered, unfleeting joy. I think in America today, especially for us, in the 21st century with technology and and all kinds of innovation, America today, the land of opportunity, it can give us a false assessment, a false idea of what it looks like to have goals and to look at that, those goals and dreams that could be wonderful and good, but say, I, I've got a shot at making those dreams and realities and uh, realities and making those goals something that I can actually attain, which is good, which is fine. But, you know, I think we sometimes deceive ourselves from thinking, I can achieve that. And when I do, I'm going to be happy. It's right around the corner. I mean, you, you invest in a, any stock market or, or cryptocurrency. There's all kinds of things where you can be millionaires overnight. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane, the world that we live in. A lot of good, but I think it gives us a false idea of, of what will make us happy. And the idea, the, the possibility of getting it is so much more real today than it ever has been before. That's what, it, what's, what it's like to live in our world today. And, and, you know, we may call it things like drive or ambition, tenacity, which is all good. And those are all good things, but I think the pursuit is going to be never-ending because the promise of fulfillment can actually never be satisfied from, without, from outside of you. That, that journey is never going to fully satisfy you if it's from outside of you. You know, we live in a world, perhaps you struggle with this as well, I certainly know, the struggle to find joy and contentment in the world. Perhaps like the woman at the well, You have struggles, perhaps shameful ones. Perhaps you search new jobs, or perhaps you look for new friends, or perhaps you visit many churches. Perhaps you go through possessions constantly, trying to find something that will make your life meaningful, whether it's hobbies or or travel. Whatever it is, a constant pursuit, something satisfy me, something stop the search for me finding fulfillment in this life. But here's the thing, friends. The few people in this world who have actually set out goals, reached them, perhaps even exceeded them, perhaps all of them, far too often we see, finally realizing that it wasn't enough. That you can reach everything that you possibly want, all the aspirations that have become reality in a person's life, and finally just to realize that it does not satisfy the inner longings and emptiness that has been driving an individual all along. You know, there's many examples in society and history of this. I want to give you one example of one. A famous novelist and writer who is known throughout the world, a man named David Foster Wallace, top of his profession. He, before he passed away, gave this famous commencement speech that's now famous. And this is what he said in his words. David Foster Wallace says, Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if that is where you go to tap real meaning in your life, then you will never have enough. It'll feel like you never have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths inside you before you actually die. Worship power and you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart. And you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. He continues to say, look, the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they are evil or sinful, It is that they are unconscious. They are default settings. Now this is David Wallace saying this. Uh, You may or may not know, but he is not a religious man. He was no religious man. He didn't have a mind or thought or care for God. But he did understand this very important key fact in life. And that is that everyone worships something. 
Everyone trusts in something for salvation, for them to be saved by something, to give, infuse meaning into their life. That everyone looks to some God, whether religious or not, to give them meaning and purpose. They, they will sit at the feet of these gods and look up and say, satisfy me, give me what I want. Friends, it is a tragedy when you hear stories like this because this man, just two years after he gave this commencement speech, took his own life. And it's a, it's a haunting reality to know that some of his last words were that whatever you worship will eat you alive. Because the pursuit is never ending. And you'll do anything to get there. Whether it's, whether it's good or evil, the pursuit to find longing in anything outside of yourself will prove fatal. Jesus is telling this woman, he is telling us today, that unless you are worshiping me, unless you are the one who looks to me for purpose and salvation and meaning, unless you allow the living water that I provide that will never allow you to thirst again, unless you look to me, find purpose in me, all of your longings, all the things that you long for and pursue will eventually leave you abandoned and hopeless. Can I tell you, friends, the reality of life is that your promotion does not care about you. Your bank balance does not care about you. That island vacation does not know you exist, does not care for you. Your pursuit of that social rank or status or perfect body or any of it has no ability to give you a thing. And yet we long for these kinds, to be, these kinds of things to be gods to us. We turn objects and people and pursuits into these little gods. Martin Luther, the late reformer, theologian, has said this famously. The human heart is a perpetual, a perpetual idol factory. We churn out these, these little gods like an idol factory, constantly producing them, saying, give me what I want. I will worship you, just give me what I want. But all of these gods that we produce in our hearts, not only will they never satisfy us, not only can they not satisfy us, but let me tell you what. When you fail to meet up the, to the standards of what these gods require of you, when you don't measure up, when you are not beautiful enough, successful enough, don't have the right social friends or relationships, these, these false gods will not forgive you. They will remind you of your failure. They will remind you how you have not measured up. But Jesus, Jesus, the one who can actually satisfy you, the one who can actually fully, completely, exhaustively, comprehensively give you all that you need, all that you've been longing for, not only does he satisfy you, but when you fail, he will forgive you. He will give you grace and mercy and draw you back to himself. Countless second chances will he give you because he loves you. He is not like the false gods who promise false satisfaction. When you fail, they are nowhere to be found. He is the God who has come into the world to give you all that your heart longs for and will give you the grace and mercy to persevere in life even when you mess up. A Savior who loves us. And so this woman hears this. She hears of the living water. And how does she respond to Jesus? She says in verse 15, Sir, Give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. You know, this woman at the well is actually won over by the pitch that Jesus has about living water. Perhaps she is relieved by the thought that she doesn't have to lug around water anymore, right? I think she's actually still thinking physical water. I think she thinks there's some kind of a, a, a spring that's never-ending, constantly bubbling up, that she will never have to go at noon in a hot day sun, worried about people looking at her, and she's wondering if there's that kind of living water that will forever be possible for me to access. I want that kind of living water. So Jesus, give me living water. You know, at, at the very least, she's interested. Whether she has everything right or not, at least she's interested in what Jesus is offering. So I would say it's a good start for Jesus. Or maybe, maybe you just take the win, Jesus, and you count, you count this a win and you move on. Right? You would, you would, say, you would think, Jesus, you know what, this, this is probably as far as you're going to get with this woman. She's interested. We want to say just walk away, Jesus. But that's not what Jesus does. And no, he wants to make things very awkward and very tense. And he wants to go deeper. And he wants to make things 
so that the woman really has to do work with who she is. And let me ask you, when you really ask yourself the hard questions of life, when you get pressed by other people, don't you want to hide? And yet here's Jesus does not allow what is on the surface to be the only thing that she has to do work with. And so Jesus says to her in verse 16, Jesus says, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying that. You have had five husbands, and the, and the man that you are with right now is not your husband. You are right in saying this. Now, this is a staggering turn that Jesus makes here, right? I mean, the, the, the mood shifts. There's, there's talk of living water and a new, new reality for this woman, and all of a sudden, Jesus shows her who she is, exposes her for who she is, and we begin to see why this woman is an outsider of outsiders, why she has to go at noonday, not with the other woman, why she has to stay a distance from people. She is a sinner, a sinner among sinners. She has a sordid past filled with lovers. And when you hear this, I don't know about you, but when I read this, it feels like Jesus is cold and insensitive here. Like he doesn't care about this woman. Why would you do that? I mean, imagine you over, overhearing this conversation, eavesdropping on this conversation somewhere, and you hear Jesus putting out there the woman's life that perhaps for her is shameful, and she doesn't want people to know about that. Perhaps, perhaps these are the kinds of things that draw all kinds of emotions out of her, and yet Jesus is going right for it. Is Jesus trying to shame her? Is Jesus trying to humiliate this woman at the well? I think it's just the opposite. I think that Jesus wants to know the real her. You know, I heard one pastor say, a lot of life is us showing people who we are except for like 10% of us or 5% of us or maybe even just 1% of who we really are. And Jesus here is saying, I want every bit of who you are. I, I want to know the 10%, the 5%, the 1% that no one else knows. Jesus desi desires to know her, not just the religious side, the moral side, the part that she gives out to everybody else, the part that comes into church, puts a smile on their face, raises their hand, says, God bless you, but we're rotting on the inside. Jesus wants to know the real woman. He wants to know her for who she is. He, he comes to her, and he wants her at her worst. That's why Jesus came into the world, not so that we could meet Jesus all put together, that we can fix ourselves and then present ourselves to Jesus. No, Jesus came into the world for sinners, for the ungodly, for the worst of us. You know, this is the one person, Jesus, this is the one person in the world who knows you completely. Think about that. No one else in the world knows everything about you. Even though this woman is trying to hide, Jesus knows her. He knows everything about her. And listen, this is, the, this is perhaps the best news or the worst news for some of us. This is the most important person in the world. And he knows everything about you. And we can't hide. And so Jesus is pressing in. It is while she was at her worst that Christ came for her. And so Jesus, would you hear this this morning? You and I may have doubts. You and I may have failures. You and I may have a sordid past. But when, when Thomas came with his doubts, Jesus was not taken aback by them. When Peter denied Jesus, Jesus was not taken aback by that. When this woman is before Jesus, Jesus is not, he is not phased at all. Instead, he pursues deeper, brings back, restores, gives good news to people who are broken. And so, as we continue to hear her story, the woman goes on to say, it's almost as if she's shifting topics, right? Can you imagine someone who you've never met before telling you all that you've done? I mean, what, what's her possible response to that? And she says in verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I perceive that you know a lot of things. And, and then she sort of starts to dodge. She says, you know, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. She's talking about her religion. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And, you know, she's trying to dodge this woman. God, Jesus just revealed her entire life, and this is the question that she asks. 
Jesus actually entertains the question. He says, women, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman says to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Listen, there's a lot in this section that we don't have time to unpack at all. But this is all I want you to hear here. This woman tries to divert and dodge. A couple of things. Jesus actually entertains her questions. As, as shifty as she might be, she, Jesus actually stops and answers her questions with, with the right answers. He doesn't fall for the trap and go on a tangent. He brings it back, and he's trying to continue to pursue her with what matters most. But what else happens here? You know, I don't think she has, it's dawned on her who is before her. And so what happens in verse 26? Jesus says to her, you're looking for the Messiah to answer all your questions. She says, when he comes, he'll take care of it. He'll answer all my questions. And then Jesus drops the bomb, the truth bomb in verse 26. He says to her, I who speak to you am he. He is the Messiah, the Christ. Listen, this passage, Nate read 42 verses today. We're not going to get to every single verse. We're going to be closing soon. When, if we had time to get into all of it, this woman you know, was astounded by what Jesus just told her. She, he's a, she's astounded by it. It says that she's, she's so overwhelmed by what, by what he told her about her life, about living water, about who he is, and she's so compelled that she, she leaves her jar behind. She forgets the jar, perhaps not to be weighed down by it, goes back to her neighborhood and tells everyone, come see a man who has told me everything about who I am. Perhaps he's the Christ. She compelled goes and leaves. And they're all probably wondering in their minds, what do you think? Oh, this must be man number seven for you. Right? She probably knows. They're, they're going to think something. I'm, I'm coming with another man. I'm telling, I'm telling everyone he's great. And perhaps they are thinking, yeah, this is man number seven. But she knows it, and she, she doesn't let it stop. She, she tells him, come see a man. He might be the Christ. He told me everything about myself. And guess what happens? They actually come to see him. And what else? They invite him into their homes. And what else? Verse 42 says, they said to the woman, listen, you told us about Jesus, but it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. And so much to unpack there we don't have time for. There's so much more to say about the woman, her overwhelming response to Jesus, not even to mention the fact that the disciples want nothing to do with any of this because they still can't believe Jesus has engaged with a Samaritan woman. They forgot all too quickly that they were once on the outside, brought inside. And Jesus has to remind them of all the lost who are out there waiting to know Jesus, that the harvest is plenty, that there's still reaping and sowing to do. But I'll close with just a couple of thoughts. As Jesus pursues this woman at the well, you know, he is continuing to seek people out today. He is always pursuing more worshipers to come follow him. Not because he, he just wants worship, which he does and it's owed to him, but he knows that when you worship anything but him, you will fall and go into folly and ruin and destruction. He knows that it is your good to worship him. And so he's seeking worshipers to know him to be loved by him, to be saved by him. You might be here perhaps with a sordid past like this woman or perhaps with some sins, maybe not as bad. Or perhaps you're like a man that if you read in chapter three of the Gospel of John, a man named Nicodemus who does not look anything like this woman. In fact, it's almost the polar opposite. Here's a man who has it all together. He's a religious type. He's accomplished many things in his life. He's respected by all and yet someone who still needed saving from himself and his religion and self-righteousness. Both types of people, a woman at the well, complete polar opposite, a religious man put together, both equally in need of saving. And yet still you might say that I'm neither of those. Perhaps you would say, listen, I'm a morally good person. I do good things to people, but I'm not religious. There might be a God, I'm not sure, but either way I'm a good person. I think that's all that should matter. 
And I hear that. You know, often I think that when I look out into the Christian world, into the church world, when I look into my own heart, I know a lot, of better, a lot more better people than, than myself who don't know Jesus. And so I, I, will, I will completely agree with you that there are good people in the world who don't know Jesus. But I want to ask you, is that all that matters? That we are morally good people in the world? I'll close just with a couple of thoughts that I heard from a pastor this past week. Would you imagine for a woman that, a moment there's a, a wood, widow with a son, and he's ra- she's raised him and have put him through good schools and universities, and at great sacrifice to herself, she's given him everything, a woman of little means, and as she's raising him, she says, son, I want you to live a good life. I want you to always tell the truth, always work hard, care for the poor with the resources that you have. And after the young man graduates from college, he goes off into his career in life, but he never speaks to his mother again. Perhaps occasionally it sends a birthday card, but never calls, never visits. What if you asked him about his relationship with his mother and he responded, no, I don't have anything to do with her personally, but I always tell the truth. I work hard, I care for the poor. I've lived a good life, that's all that matters, isn't it? And this pastor says, you know, I doubt you would ever be satisfied with that kind of an answer. Because it's not enough for the man to merely live a moral life as his mother desired without having any kind of relationship with her. His behavior is commendable because, in fact, she gave him all he has. More than just a moral life, he owes her love and loyalty. And he says, if there is a God, you owe him literally everything. If there is a God, you owe him far more than just a moral life. He deserves to be at the center of our lives, friends, if there is a God. Would you know this day that this woman found salvation because of one primary reason, one event that launched into her life? That's because Jesus was seeking water. He was thirsty. God let himself become thirsty so that he could be at a well. He came into the world as a vulnerable person to be thirsty and tired like us. I wonder if this woman years later would meet Jesus at the foot of the cross when nails are in his hands, thorns on his head. And I wonder if she would look there and say, come see a man who became thirsty so that I might become satisfied. Come see a man. He was once thirsty a while ago, but now he is cosmically thirsty so that you and I could be satisfied. For on that cross, he was thirsty. He was cosmically cut off from his father, alone, broken, tortured, it's because Jesus experienced all of that for you that you and I can actually be satisfied in this life. Friends, this living water is available for all of us. Skeptics, believers, seekers, the moral, the the immoral, every race, every gender, every type of person, living water that will forever satisfy is offered to you today. And so would you come and consider Jesus, the living water himself, ready to give you all that you need in life. Let's pray together. Our Father, we, we come to you now and we pray that our hearts would be open in this moment to know what you are doing in our hearts. For those of us who perhaps don't know you, would you open up our eyes to consider that they may, there may be more to life than just pursuits and hobbies and relationships and finding purpose in things outside of us. Perhaps there's something more in this life that we could give ourselves to. And would you, oh God, I pray, allow that to be uh, uh, something that we wrestle with in this moment. For those of us who don't know you, pray that you would infuse your spirit. Allow grace to invade hearts right now. I pray for those of us who do know you, that places that we've gone for pleasure and for contentment and fulfillment, places that are not you, little gods that have failed to satisfy us, that we would turn from those things and run back to you for your your arms are full of mercy for us. Your grace is abounding, mercy unending, love that is full and good for us. And so we pray, O Lord, that whether we know you or not today, that you would find us in your grace and help us, O Lord, to come to you, for you are the source of living water for us. It's in Christ's name that we pray, amen.